States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please take the roll. Councilmember Cooper. Here. Councilmember Beaton. Here. Mayor Zielinski. Here. Councilmember Sipsick. Here. Councilmember Shemansky. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Here. Councilmember Pontiac. Here. City Manager. Here. City Attorney. Here. DPW Director. Here. Finance Director. Here. Public Safety Director. Here. City Engineer. Here. Thank you. Public hearings, we have none. Citizens' comments on gender related items. Do we have any citizens that would like to comment on gender related items this evening? Yes, no. Seeing none. Consent agenda. All items marked with an asterisk are on the consent agenda and considered by the city manager to be routine matters. Prior to approval of the consent agenda, any member of council may have an item from the consent agenda removed and taken up during the regular portion of the meeting. Consent agenda items include approval of minutes, payroll invoices, Consideration of Ordinance 20-02, approving amendments to the City of Manistee Downtown, City of, Manis, City of Manistee Development Plan and Tax Increment Financing Plan. Notification regarding next work session. Consideration of a banner permit for the Manistee Area Chamber of Commerce. Consideration of Run the Pier 5K to hold a run walk on Saturday, August 8, 2020 at 8, 8, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. The race would take would uh, take city streets from Veterans Memorial Park, west to Fifth Avenue Pier, around the lighthouse, and then return to Veterans Memorial Park. At this time, council got to take action to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion on that, those items? Seeing none, please take the roll. Councilmember Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Sipsick. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Cooper. Yes. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Unfinished business, we have none. New business. Consider consideration of local revenue sharing board grant application. The local Re revenue sharing board distributes 2% from the Little River Casino. The, the deadline for the 2020 Cycle 1 application is Friday, March 6, 2020 at 5 p.m. City staff has prepared two, prepared two grant applications for submission to the Local Revenue Sharing Board. This agenda items will include two separate motions, one for each application. The first one, at this time, Council could take action to authorize the submission of a grant application to a Local Revenue Sharing Board for the fire department firefighter turnout gear in the amount of $44,658.80. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. I have a motion to second. Is there any discussion or questions? Uh, just, just a side note. Um, did a little bit, in, little bit of investigation into the cost of these items, and I think you've got a really good price on them per person. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Any other? Seeing none, please take the roll. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Cooper. Yes. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Sipsick. Yes. Motion approved. The second one. At this time, Council could take action to authorize the submission of a grant application to the Local Revenue Sharing Board for the Police Department for FN 303 less legal weapon system in the amount of $2,048. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you. Any discussion? Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? I'm still not sure what kind of weapon this is. It seems like it's halfway between a BB gun and a taser or something. I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. The best way to describe it is an extended range baton. It's uh, sort of after the uh, 
paintball type of system, if that helps you out when people have those paintball fights, but it's a lot more accurate. It's a bismuth back um, system that allows us to stand back up to almost 100 yards to be able to um, hopefully neutralize somebody that's in a situation that we shouldn't be approaching them on, usually on a suicidal or in a mental health situation. We don't have anything like that in the county. Well, as we have is our tasers, our batons, and our mace. So they allow us <laughs> to stand back like we should be doing and not have to approach, not have to hopefully push somebody to do something they don't really want to. So you're getting one of them, right? right. So in these particular cases, when you go out on a call, do you know for a fact that you'd have to use one of these things? There's going to be a policy that we'll adopt. There's going to be certain parameters that we're going to have to notify everybody on scene that this is being deployed. Um, everybody will be trained as policy use. We'll have an instructor that's built into it that we can um, um, have um, on staff to be able to train it. Um, we try to have use everything else objectively reasonable to mitigate the situation first, but wherever we have to take any type of force. I'm, Lately, twice when I'm within the last couple months, there's been situations within the county where there has been uh, people in distress or we have had to, police have had to encounter where we haven't had this available and that's what triggered me to want to put in for this. I was an instructor when I was downstate and we had these downstate. They're a good tool to have. We very rarely ever use them, but we just don't have that tool. And I'd rather not have officers have to go to a higher level of force when they could utilize this within the force continuum. So you anticipate that we'll be able to use this in the city other than, I mean, I mean, how frequently? It will be a tool in our toolbox to be able to utilize. It's more of a situation where somebody's in distress, <laughs> I'm gonna kill myself, I have, I have a weapon, we're trying to negotiate, trying to negotiate, we've done everything possible to give that, you know, get that person to give up so we can get them some assistance. And if we have to take them into protective custody, we might have to utilize this. Okay, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anything else? Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, please take a roll. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Pontiac. Yes. Council Member Beaton. Yes. Council Member Sipsick. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Cooper. Yes. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of approving the purchase of a mobile pump for the sanitary sewer system. The city purchased a mobile trailer mounted pump several years ago to be utilized during emergency maintenance and construction projects. Due to the high volume of usage and eagle requirements for wet weather management, a second pump is required. The new pump was selected to match the existing pump for consistency in operation and maintenance. At this time, council could take action to approve the purchase of the Pioneer Pump for, from Kennedy Industries in the amount of $46,895. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Jeff, this is exactly the same thing as what you got already, one of them, right? You just want this for a backup. Yes, this is, would be the same as what we have. They did switch their engine supplier, but other than that, the pump itself is the same. And this is in part due because of the project we're going to be starting next next spring. And this, because one of those projects, right, you're going to need that pump almost full time? The, it's really twofold. The first one um, we talked about at the last council meeting when you approved the Arthur Street pump station improvements and the contractor deducted over $40,000 for the city to handle the bypass pumping. So we're using it almost during every one of our sanitary construction projects and then it's not available for other uses that we normally have. But the biggest item is because of the high lake levels, water has uh, tipped from our storm sewer into our sanitary sewer and it's flooded out the treatment plant. For over the past year, we've been uh, treating over a million gallons of Manistee Lake water a day and putting it through the treatment plant. So we needed, the state required us to come up with a mitigation plan to counteract that. And part of that plan was to raise the weir um, in CS or SSO 18. When we raised the weir, um, it 
prevents some of that lake water from coming into the sanitary system, but it also creates the concern that if we get a surcharge on the sanitary side, it has the potential to back up basements. So to help mitigate that, um, our plan includes having a pump available and ready to put into that, that chamber at any time we get that uh, situation so we, don't, so we can prevent the basement backups. Okay. So it's really twofold. Okay, thank you. Question for Mr. Taylor. Um, I had a question. Go ahead. How are we going to pay? Now, how does this get paid for? What? Well, the current pump has been paid for about six times just by reduction in construction costs from, um, from bypass pumping on previous projects. This one will be paid for out of the water and sewer reserves right now. And my anticipate it will pay for itself within a year to two. That was my question. Thank you. Nothing else? Please take the roll. Councilmember Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Sipsick. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Cooper. Yes. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of awarding a contract to resurface the First Street Beach Tennis Court. The city received a grant from the Manistee County Foundation to upgrade the tennis court at First Street Beach. The resurfacing and painting work were publicly bid with three bids received. Pro surface $53,400. Sports Incorporated $46,775. Tennis Court Unlimited $25,600. The contract was prepared by the city engineer and approved by the city attorney. At this time, council could take action to approve a contract and notice of award with low responsible bidder, Tennis Court Unlimited, in the amount of $25,600 and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the documents. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, what kind of warranty comes with this particular um, company tennis courts unlimited on, on the resurfacing. Cheat yourself a cheat. Good evening, Council. Uh, it's set up for a one year, there's a one year warranty built into the, uh, the con um, our contract documents. That is actually one of the reasons we rebid the project. Um, because the concrete out there does have a lot of cracks in it. And so there's some concerns from the, uh, the vendors of um, warranting the work, but it's a standard one-year warranty. That's, that's typical of, a lot of, of our contracts anyway. So, but um, that would be, that'd be the warranty period it's a year. Is there any kind of sealant they put on top of it? The coating itself kind of is that sealant to some extent. <laughs> It's, uh, it's like any other pavement, it's just kind of, you're putting a, it's not meant to last, you know, 10, 20 years is something you may get back in, you know, 10 years from now you may go back and freshen it up. This, is, we got a lot out of this coat that's been on there, I think it was 20, probably 20 plus years, and if you've, if you've seen it, it's all peeled up, but uh, we kind of used every, every inch of the life of that coating. Um, the next level is really replacing underneath it, you're getting to replacing the concrete, and that was, very very expensive endeavor so this is kind of like we do with our roads it's um it's asset management you know get some more life out of the, that base and we'll look at it again in, you know 10 years out or so is that why the other uh, bids were so much higher so maybe they wanted to go down uh i i think it, i don't know if that was the reason um we if you recall this was bid out as a package we had some other things in it we couldn't get bidders and the, um, the warranty came up, so we, we kind of set it up again for just doing the um, surfacing work. But I don't believe it had anything to do with the warranty. I think they were just busy um, or had to travel. Some of these uh, vendors were from Ohio. Okay. Um, so, and we, were, we had a lot of concerns about the low bid. Honestly, we was, it, was, it matched our estimate, but it was a lot lower than everybody else. But we checked on them. They've done some beautiful work for U of M. Um, they got a great reputation. Uh, if you went to the website, you'd kind of see some of the products. So we're, we're comfortable with them. Okay, thank you. I have a question. What's the start date? <laughs> the temperature's gotta be, I think it's 50 and rising. 
So we'll be, you know, well into early spring before we can, uh, uh, they're not gonna wanna put it on too soon. They don't wanna put it on when the, when the concrete's cold. Hey Jeff, wasn't the Manistee Area Public Schools gonna go half on that or something? They're not going half, but um, they have agreed to um, enter into a service agreement which they would pay the city annually, uh, say over an eight or 10 year period to allow for the use of this. Um, that's the legal way that they can contribute to the project. And I was just gonna mention that I, I just talked to the tennis coach uh, last Thursday. And so we'll be coordinating with the contractor and with, with, um, with the high school to make sure that, you know, the construction doesn't interfere with their spring sports and so forth. And they plan on if it does, create some temporary, uh, they're gonna have to practice out of out of the city, um, possibly go, go up to Onekama, but the fact that there will be courts here for them to practice on will allow them to have a field, or a, have a team this spring. How long are they anticipating before they build their own like they talked about? Um, I couldn't answer that. I know it's in their capital improvement plans, but I don't, ha I don't know. Okay. Well, did the grant cover the cost? Yeah, like Sean said, we, we originally bid this as a whole package. There's other things like um, adding ADA sidewalks from the parking spaces up to the court. There's new, uh, new nets and posts. Um, we included screening along the fences uh, to help block the wind, but also help block the sand migration. And then uh, after we awarded the grant, we also had a, a donation of cash from a, a local citizen to build a backboard uh, where you can hit up against and uh, practice. So we ended up separating all of those items out of this and um, my staff and I will be making those purchases directly um, and that, that simplified this contract and to allow us to attract bidders to bid it for just the surfacing. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none, please take the roll. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Sipsick. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Cooper. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of a request from Oceana County Housing Commission Limited Division Housing Association for a payment in lieu of taxes and a municipal services agreement for the senior housing construction project. The Oceana County Housing Commission Limited Division Housing Association is proposing an income-based senior housing project adjacent to the Wagner Center. The developer intends to use the MISTA LIHTC program as part of their financing plan. Participation in LIHTC requires a pilot from the city. In addition to the pilot request, the developer is offering a municipal services agreement. At this time, council could take action to direct staff to draft a pilot ordinance and municipal services agreement and present both at the March 3rd, 2020 council meeting for council consideration. Do I have a motion? We, we do have uh, the developer here that would like to make a presentation on the scope of the project. Sure. While they're coming up, up front, I just, it, it, in full disclosure, I think I should let you know that I'm one of those neighbors uh, near enough to the property where I got a notice from the Planning Commission meeting um, that this was going to happen. So uh, they're notifying the neighborhood within the 300 feet or whatever it is. Um, Hi, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sarah Howard, the Executive Director at the Madison County Council on Aging. Um, and I just wanted to let you know a little bit about um, our relationship with the Oceana um, Home Buildership, our partnership, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons we thought this was such a good relationship was <laughs> we're a nonprofit, they're a nonprofit, um, and our housing needs for our um, seniors in Manistee are, are are great actually at this time. We're looking for affordable and attainable housing. Um, the majority of Manistee's population is 50 years and over. Uh, our senior households, for, they're forecasted to increase faster than the overall market. 
Um, senior housing demand continues to increase as retirees locate, relocate to the area, and our affordable housing options uh, for seniors are a persistent need. Um, and what we have is just not meeting their needs at this time. So um, I just want to tell you it's really important, I think, for our seniors and for our seniors for the future. So, and I'm going to introduce Kendra Thompson, who's the architect on the project. <coughs> We met actually um, through a project that we're doing, which is the Wagner Center, Community Center, and she has already worked with this group, so that's how we got together. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Kendra Thompson. I'm a local architect. So as Sarah said, I've been working with the Manistee County Council on Aging on the development of the Wagner Center. Uh, we have great plans for that, and they are diligently uh, pursuing um, fundraising. We're about to start a roof replacement project, so that'll, that'll make everyone happy that uh, things are happening there on a pretty significant level. Um, I do work uh, throughout the state, and I've done a number of affordable housing projects. And most recently, I've had some success successes working with the Oceana County Housing Commission on a few tax credit type projects. Uh, so I have on one hand the folks at Massey County Council on Aging, and I have on the other hand successful projects happening down in Oceana County for addressing their affordable housing needs, and it's like, ha-ha, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. These folks need to get together and <coughs> see what we can do in Manistee to address uh, senior housing in a common sense uh, fashion. So um, what, what they'll be talking about this evening is just that project. So. Uh, your packet includes a rendering of what's being proposed. It's 46 units, 23 are one bedroom units of about 830 square feet, uh, and tw 23 of them are two bedroom units of just over 1,000 square feet. So nice sized units. Um, these are being referred to as cottages. We're doing a very similar project to this um, on Griswold Street down in Hart right now. So. Uh, the project will be 23 unit uh, duplexes, 23 buildings, and it will um, circulate on both sides of Monroe Street, uh, the north side of Monroe Street, creating a loop, and as well as on the west property of the Wagner Center parcel. Um, these units are being developed as a single story um, uh, project. Uh, all of them are handicap accessible, barrier free, universal design on all of them. Uh, six of the units will be true, fully built out uh, ADA units, and the others will be, as I mentioned, universal design. Um, <clears throat> so it allows us for, allows seniors to age in place. So um, the units all have a one car attached garage. They all come fully equipped with dishwashers, garbage disposals, uh, in-unit washer and dryers. Um, and so amenities are taken care of um, within the unit. Um, they're air conditioned. Um, uh, these are, all of these units will be in compliance with green, um, enterprise green community certification process, meaning we're building green. Uh, vegetation will be native species, uh, walkable sidewalks, direct connections over to uh, the Wagner Center because we see that direct connection between the activities at the Wagner Center. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce, we have uh, some folks from the Oce Oceana County Housing Commission and Home Partnership, Paul Inglis, uh, as well as Ross Field, and then Al Martin who's um, going to talk to you about a little bit of the details of the request before you. Good evening. My name is Paul Inglis. This is Ross Field. This is Alan Martin. Um, just to give you a little background of why is Oceana County involved, in case some of the folks in the audience are concerned, as well as the council members. Um, I was the Oceana County Administrator up until 2008, and one of the things that I saw as a great need in Oceana County was the need for affordable, decent, safe housing for the residents of Oceana County. 
not just seniors, but <coughs> at all levels. So the County Board of Commissioners created by ordinance the Oceana County Housing Commission in 2007. And uh, so, we've, so we've been in the business now for about 13 years, trying to serve the, the uh, region's attainable housing needs during that time. And we believe that quality housing opportunities of all types at all price levels are vital for creating a community where residents can live, work, play, raise their families, and retire in security. So in, in 19, or excuse me, in 2018, <coughs> we built, started the first of our two housing projects. Just to let you know that we do have experience in this. Uh, we've been down that road uh, through the assistance of, especially through the assistance of Kendra and Al. But we have a low income housing tax credit project in Hart, 24 units. We are currently in the process of finishing up a 10 unit duplex cottage project for seniors in, uh, in the city of Hart. And we're also planning a project for the village of Shelby. I happen to be the village president <coughs> currently. And again, this one of my objectives is to get more housing for our community. How do we get involved with Oceana's Home Partnership? Um, we feel that in order to strengthen our ability to develop housing projects, we needed to merge with a, an organization that had years of experience. Oceana's Home Partnership has had 32 years of experience and, and we are now in the process of merging with them. And I don't need to go into all the projects they've done, but they have served projects in Oceana, in Mason, Manistee, Lake Counties. And uh, we, we have uh, provided, or I should say Oceana Home Partnership has provided direct services to households in Manistee. So they have experience here through their foreclosure prevention and home buyer counseling services programs. Again, to re reiterate, we want to see safe, decent, and affordable housing, not only for Oceana County, but for the whole entire Western Michigan. And the key here is we're not looking to make money. We're looking to make an impact. And we think that a 46 unit project in Manistee will make a significant impact on your city and your area. <clears throat> I guess about all I can say is the other it's been mentioned is that we were invited into this process through the Manistee County Council on Aging by our architect uh, Kendra Thompson to see what could be done and this is what they are bringing to you tonight. So what I'd like to say is we look forward to working alongside the city of Manistee and the Manistee Council on Aging to bring new housing opportunities for the senior citizens of Manistee. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm all for, for that because we need that housing, but what is the pilot and a municipal service agreement, or don't you know yet? This gentleman right here will okay. answer those questions. We've, uh, I, had, I had a couple of questions before that. Okay. Um, what, is the, what is the oldest um, development that you've that you built? The oldest was the Barnett project that was done in Shelby by the Ocean Home Partnership, not by the Housing Commission. We're, <laughs> our relationship with them is relatively new. Um, but again, we're in the process of merging. And that project was done, let's see, I'm not sure, at least 10 years ago. I should know, I live in Shelby, but I don't. Think about that. About 10, 12 years About 10 ago. years ago, 12 years ago. Has there been, <clears throat> and, and they're, so they're, say, 12 years old, um, has there been any um, renovation work required on them since that time? The only changes there are their the management companies have changed uh, over the, that period of time, but the, and I, I live within six blocks of that, of, that com, of that complex, and their problems are very few. Our, our law enforcement personnel are not there all the time, you know, dealing with illicit behavior of any kind. The, the residents, and that's a 32 unit complex. Okay. And the residents of that complex have created their own council. So they're, they, they kind of self-enforce the rules there. And uh, it's, it, 
been successful. We, like I said, we haven't had problems at all. But there's been no major renovation no. requirements, no new roofs, no, no gutting of the units and starting over yes, or anything? The same units that were built 10, 12 years ago. They're very well built um, yeah. because of the financing and the steps that we go through there. We're held at a very high uh, <coughs> level of uh, construction quality. Kendrick could express that more um, okay. than we do, but those are good buildings that they built. I, I think it was 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. And they're, if you would drive into it now, you would think it might be five, six years old. They're, they look good. They were built when I tried to retire, so I <laughs> Any other questions? You want me to talk about the pilot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we proposed a 4% pilot um, consistent with uh, an ordinance that we received from uh, city manager along with a municipal services agreement for $200 per unit per year, increasing at 3% a year. Uh, one thing I did want to point out about this pilot, which is a little different, I think, than some of your ordinance. Um, after the 15-year compliance period, which is probably an 18-year total with development time and uh, construction time and lease-up time, um, we intend to sell these units to the tenants. And at that point, the pilot will officially end and the units will go on the tax rolls at whatever the SCV is at that time. Um, so whereas most pilots are kind of open-ended or they talk about a 35-year term, this one will officially end at, at year 18 when they get sold um, to the tenants. So. Thank you. That's all I want to know. What if they can't afford to buy them? If they can't afford to buy or they don't desire to buy, because some people like being tenants and that's perfectly acceptable, then the Oceana Home Partnership or the Oceana County Housing Commission will buy them and keep them as rental for those people. And, but this pilot will still end and they'll go on the tax rolls okay. still. No. Anybody else? Thank you. Well, it's interesting to me that we take a piece of property that we're receiving absolutely nothing from, and we get a pilot and a municipal services agreement, and now we're getting $20,000, approximately $20,000 a year, and a huge housing project for our seniors. I think it's great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Looking forward to working with you. Do I have a motion? I'll make, make the motion. Way. Second. Are you Who was my motion? <laughs> In second? Nope. Any further discussion? Well, I, I'd just like to comment the fact that, you know, this is the, the second time that uh, the council has had an opportunity to bring senior housing to Manistee. Uh, and again, I don't know that we'd ever get a better opportunity or better offer uh, than we've got presented to us tonight. So thank you very much for working that, Kendra and, and Sarah, if it wasn't for you um, taking this leap, that we would have never had uh, a project like this to be brought forward. So thank you very much. I also would like to echo what Mr. Zmanski just said, but I'd also like to encourage people that these LIHTC grants and um, these tax credits that these people are applying for, we need to get letters to our representatives, state and federal. We need to encourage them to get behind this project. If you're for this project, get behind it, write those people, call them. I'd hate to use the word badger, but I will. Do whatever it takes to get those tax credits so this project can be completed. With that, take the roll. Councilmember Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Sipsick. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Cooper. Yes. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Councilmember Schmansky. Yes. Councilmember Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Notice the communications and announcement. Tonight we have a report from the Economic Development. Mr. Miller, report of the activities of the Economic Development and respond to any questions. Welcome, Mr. Miller. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. It's uh, good to be back for my second report. Uh, last week, I uh, forwarded on to you all a uh, fourth quarter report on economic <coughs> development from the Department <coughs> for my activities. 
of our collective activities, I should say. I also uh, forwarded on um, a report, a monthly report that covers uh, the, from the second week of January to the second week of February. And so I'll be giving you the highlights this evening about those uh, reports and entertain any questions. Um, I want to start out, first of all, with our business retention program. Uh, we have been uh, actively uh, engaging business members to talk to them about their business expansion plans, any concerns they might have, and to be able to uh, address any resources and try to identify resources for them to, uh, to meet those goals and to uh, try to uh, uh, expand their businesses. So I, I do have to report that uh, we're very pleased that one of those uh, early retention visits that I held back in September um, actually has borne fruit. Um, so the North Channel Brewing Company uh, was one of my very first business retention visits. And we learned about their business retention plans and put them in touch with the Agriculture and Rural Development Department. Uh, and uh, they pursued a grant. Uh, so we just learned a few weeks ago that uh, that had borne fruit. And they were able to uh, receive the maximum amount of a $100,000 grant uh, that will expand uh, their, uh, their employee base uh, by making three to five <coughs> of their employees uh, year round so that they can can and bottle their uh, product uh, for, uh, for distribution beyond just their brewery here in Manistee. And so they have also worked on a Ludington uh, beverage uh, agreement that allows them to distribute. Uh, and so we're really pleased to have that happen. That gives you an idea of what can happen when you go and sit down and, uh, and have these retention visits. Um, well, it's a, a very good positive uh, outcome as a result of that. So in the fourth quarter, uh, we had 11 of those retention visits uh, from October to December. Uh, and then again, uh, in the month of uh, January to February, we had another five. Uh, so we're on track to meet uh, your metric of <coughs> four per month, uh, and so we're doing uh, fairly well with those. Uh, we also want to uh, point out uh, that we're uh, making contacts about uh, <coughs> housing developments uh, as well as potential uh, purchasers of uh, some of the blighted sites here in Manistee. Um, so one of the uh, outcomes we had, the uh, city manager uh, Taylor uh, actually brought us in uh, to a conversation with the Oceana folks that you just heard from. Uh, so we were able to uh, listen and help uh, help along with uh, with that. And I would like to just uh, applaud all of you for recognizing the importance of that 46 unit um, uh, project. Uh, we have a need in this county for 400 new units of housing a year, according to Housing North. And so uh, that's a, a big demand. Uh, this will help meet that demand. And eventually, when the uh, project is completed, uh, there'll be 46 uh, potential homes in the Manistee area that will be open <coughs> for others to purchase and to renovate and to live in uh, and help meet that demand. So that's uh, very important. I just want to point that out. Um, we've been working on communications. Uh, we started to run monthly columns. Uh, we're doing Manistee Forward in the newspaper. We're working on Manistee Forward, and then those efforts are, are bearing fruit and having good discussion and collaboration between all of our partners here in the area. Uh, one thing I will also point out is that in the fourth <coughs> quarter, beginning of the 1st of January, we negotiated a uh, services MOU uh, with the Manistee DDA. Uh, so that I will be uh, working on and, uh, and being compensated for some of that work that we're doing in Manistee uh, downtown. So we'll, uh, we appreciate that. I know that uh, <coughs> several of you are advocates for that, and so we appreciate, uh, appreciate that support as well. Um, another highlight we want to point out, uh, we worked with the uh, MEDC on a uh, study for the Renaissance Business Park. Uh, so we were working with them over the month and uh, of December <coughs> to uh, advise that and uh, and to bring that forward. Uh, so we hopefully that will bear some fruit with some attraction of businesses that would come to uh, come to the Manistee area. Uh, again, we've been hitting our retention visits. We've had a number of developer engagements, especially in the last couple of months. Uh, and because the word is getting out about my position. 
as a result of the communications, uh, coming to meetings such as this, uh, we're seeing a lot of people reaching out uh, and asking for help and support and starting up new businesses. So in the last month, I've had seven of those contacts, uh, which is a good positive sign. And uh, so uh, the program is starting to bear <coughs> work. Uh, so we're working with those folks and, um, uh, and making, uh, making good progress. Uh, we also have a couple of, of key projects that we're working on that you're aware of. Uh, the Gateway Project to downtown, uh, putting time in on that project uh, to, uh, to bring that to fruition. Uh, we also are working with West Shore Community College on the uh, 400 River Street project, a Glick, former Glicks building, uh, and so we're, we're expecting good things there. The, um, uh, uh, the bids, according to the college, were being opened, so they're making progress on their timeline, which is a positive step. Uh, and uh, we also would like to point out that uh, we have been working uh, a small amount of time on recreational trails uh, with the county planning department and, uh, and others, including uh, uh, Chairman Dantz, uh, to uh, work on bringing and connecting trails into Manistee. Uh, so that's been uh, a part of our quality of life and economic development piece uh, that we'll hopefully be able to move forward. So uh, those are the highlights. Uh, would again like to say that I appreciate all the support from the City Council and you helped make this job and this program possible with your support. So thank you for that and we hope that uh, uh, this will continue. So I'll entertain any questions you might have out. Any questions for Mr. Miller? <coughs> thank you. Thank you for Thanks. your service. Thank you. For thank, you. thank you very much. Do it soon and if there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. A few more $100 grants would be great. Yeah, we could. 100,000, I mean. There you go. <laughs> okay, next. State of the streets, city staff. Good evening. Uh, each year we kind of tally up the uh, state of the streets and bring it before council. Uh, Lucas Richardson from Spicer is giving you the first uh, edition of the 2019 report. In addition to the state of the streets, we're also going to talk about uh, some shoreline erosion, the projects, um, other capital improvement projects, possible financing um, ideas that we've got, <laughs> some grant, uh, grant match. Excuse me. So for 2019, uh, the report of projects completed is actually pretty short, but uh, fairly significant. We completed the reconstruction of 12th Street between Maple and US 31. Uh, it's just short of a half mile of streets uh, at a cost of just below $1 million total. And we did that in part with a $375,000 uh, MDOT grant uh, through the Small Urban Fund. One thing that I would like to point out before we get into uh, all the data and so forth is think about the city of Manistee has 48 miles of streets, okay? So every year, that's 48 miles of streets that we lose one year of life on. And at the best case, we added um, a half a mile that's somewhere between 16 to 18 years of life, but even let's round that to 20 years, we added the equivalent of 10 years of life at a cost of a million dollars into our street network, which means we lost a net of 30, 38 miles. <clears throat> so uh, rehabbing roads is a very expensive endeavor, um, and this is why uh, it is cheaper to keep the good roads good and do the, the heavy rehabs before we get to those reconstruction projects because even though that street turned out wonderfully, um, it's very expensive to start a street over from scratch. When we look at uh, the condition of all the streets in 2019, and this is done each fall when our staff goes out and rates every street segment uh, through the PASA ratings. So, 
the uh, the entire street network we still have 46 percent of our streets that are in poor condition 37 percent are in good 17 in fair on the right hand side we broke out uh, the major streets and the local streets on the major streets we have 40 percent of the street network that's still considered poor based on PASA ratings 30 percent good and 22 percent fair on the local streets uh, we have a greater percentage of poor at 51%, 36% good, and 13% fair. So when we do a five-year comparison, and uh, looking at both the, the local streets and the major streets, but even in the when you combine them and do all the streets together, we see two trends. We see the number of good, st good streets increasing, and we see the number of fair streets decreasing and the poor staying fairly level. And that's based on the treatments that we've been doing for the past five years, um, where we're doing what's called mill and fill. We're grinding off the surface of the existing street, paving with new. That's a heavy rehab technique. So that's really the first um, and last technique that we can do before we've got to get to full reconstruction. So the money that we've been putting into the street network over the five years, the increased money has made significant impacts on the street network um, but we haven't had we haven't gotten into a lot of the reconstruction projects that would uh, that would substantially impact the poor ratings when we look at uh, the street network compared to when we started our asset management uh, program in 2008 you can see that the good streets have have increased substantially the fair streets have gone down and the poor streets have gone down as well. So we've been making good progress and um, I think that the asset management techniques that we've been employing has had actually a very uh, positive or has reversed that trend to a positive direction instead of a negative one. And it also um, is largely due to be uh, because we've put so much uh, financial resources into it. So People are always wondering what's coming up next. And as you're aware, uh, we create a transportation improvement program and submit it to council uh, each year with the annual, in, during the annual budget process. But I will tell you behind the scenes, <clears throat> that document gets updated on a monthly basis um, every time we find a new grant program, every time we're able to stretch a dollar a little bit further, um, every time we find some way to leverage and move the projects forward we're constantly adjusting constantly updating that so the green projects that you see are what we've got planned for 2020 and last year we had actually planned a lot of those uh, to be completed uh, in 2019 however some delays in the funding uh, through the mostly through the federal funding um, the rural development grants or bonds um, delayed some of those projects. The green areas that you see on the north side, up at the top of the map, uh, we actually had pre-construction meetings for those uh, this today. And so those projects are ready to kick off, uh, one of them in March and one of them in April. Uh, so we'll start to see some progress on those. The projects on the lower right, um, the L-shaped one, is actually still waiting for the phase two of rural development financing but we're um, anticipating we'll still be able to, to begin that construction in 2020. And then the little green segment next to the blue is actually gonna be a, um, a pipeline that we're putting down A Street to set up for the blue project, which will be reconstruction of A Street from, um, essentially it'll be all the way from Davis Street to 31, that very bad section. And then the blue section up on the north side is the uh, Van Buren Jackson water main loop. Uh, once the water's upgraded, we'll replace those streets. In 2022, which are uh, the yellow segments, um, a large portion of that, uh, well, a section of that is the Quincy Street reconstruction, but the <coughs> large portion that includes Memorial Drive and Washington Street that we're trying to leverage money from uh, at the Michigan Department of Transportation, uh, those are the detour routes when they close the Memorial Bridge. And in 2023, uh, they plan on some heavy structural rehab 
and a closure of the Maple, or Memorial Bridge. And so we're trying to leverage them into upgrading um, the street network as part of that. And then in 2023, those are some of the projects that we've added into the transportation program that are next for mill and fills and some of the utility upgrades. So overall in the next four years, um, what we've got planned is about six, almost $6.6 .6 million worth of work and would cover over four miles of street improvements. Yes. So Mr. McCulley, if, if you don't get the money from the state, are you still going to go ahead and do what's in the yellow? Um, the Cleveland and Quincy, um, the answer would be yes. That's not dependent on the state. Um, I've got verbal that the state will be uh, participating in the upgrades of, of Memorial, Memorial Drive and Washington Street. I don't have that in writing yet uh, because they don't have it in their uh, budget cycle yet. Um, but the conversations that we've had are that they will provide what's called M money so it's money that's derived straight, state, straight from the state of Michigan and doesn't have any federal pass-through. Um, when they do that, they, um, they basically give the city the money to construct or to complete those improvements. And then uh, what we've got, and, and we talk about, talk about it a little bit more, we've got some utility enhancements below some of those street segments that we've been planning for uh, when that happens. So um, the answer is that it's really key on the state funding those segments. Okay. Um, another example is the MDOT plans to rebuild the um, bridge over the Manistee River on M55, um, the one that's real close to Meyer. When they do that, that requires a full 11 mile detour around Manistee Lake and they just provided uh, the road commission money to upgrade that detour route. Uh, the same thing as what we've requested. So uh, the road commission just approved the contracts for that and I believe they're gonna do the paving beginning in July of this summer in anticipation of that project. We're gonna get some of that in the city, is that what you're saying? We will not, but it's the same type of setup. <clears throat> um, they will contribute towards the detour improvements. Um, for the projects that you're going to start in 2020. You said some, one would start in March, one might start in April. Can you please identify those streets? Uh, several of them I can off the top of my head. The uh, one project will be upgrading Hastings and Third Avenue and installing storm sewer along those routes. Is that going to be the one in March? Do you remember? Is that the one? Yes. Okay. And that should be completed uh, by May. And then the other project includes water main upgrades, uh, some spot sanitary sewer uh, upgrades, and storm sewer on First Avenue, Second Avenue, a block of Second Avenue, a block of um, Hughes, two blocks of Melitzer, and two blocks of Fremont. And that's a separate contractor that's being completed under the rural development uh, phase one, part B. And uh, they actually will start work at the beginning of April, but they plan on starting some of the spot repairs so it won't be the <coughs> heavy construction. And then they thought by the end of April, uh, they would have their full crews in. A lot of that's depending on the frost laws and, and what the state does with frost, frost laws. Although right now there's virtually no frost in the ground, so. And we, stu we plan on having a neighborhood meeting to go over that with the residents that are uh, directly on those two projects. Okay. So if the state drops more money, how much more reasonably could you do within a year or two on, on what you currently have? Could you, could you, in other words, if you had the money, could you pick up what you have scheduled for 22 in 20 or 21? Yeah, when I said that we update the, the tip almost on a monthly basis, every time uh, the state increases what our funding is or every time a bid comes in under, under, you know, under what our estimates were, um, we look at the next segment that's planned down the road and we try to move one up. Um, 
and so we're constantly doing that. One interesting thing, though, I met with the, uh, the Transportation Service Center director out of Traverse City uh, about a week and a half ago, and you're probably aware that the state of Michigan just bonded for $3.5 billion worth of improvements. <coughs> if any of you have looked at the map, most of that is along the, the Detroit, Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, Lansing corridor, and there's one project in the North region uh, that actually got funded. But what he explained to me was that the money on an annual basis that MDOT uh, programs for stuff across the state didn't have to go to those projects. So the North region actually got more funding. Um, and I've got maps of what those <coughs> properties are if you're interested. Um, but in this year alone, uh, he told me that the MDOT North region is contracting out uh, 250,000 tons of hot mix asphalt. That exceeds the capacity of Reith Riley and Elmers to produce. So uh, we're, gonna, we're quickly getting into a capacity, a demand and supply issue, um, and we're finding that the, the tonnage of asphalt prices are going up because the, there's more demand for projects than there are contractors to complete them. That's what I was going to say, though. If, like, as Councilman said, that are you going to do some of these projects even if you got the money if you don't have the contractors out there? We'll certainly try, though. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Are we going to do then memori Memorial Drive or wait till 22? Uh, that is scheduled for 22 when we would get the MDOT funding for it. Are you going to do anything with that? I mean, it's like riding on a washboard. Uh, about all I can do is keep patching at it. No, even that helped because a lot of potholes you got there. And, and I'll tell you, when we put when we fill a pothole, it doesn't come back out. It's the piece of asphalt next to it that'll pop out. But yeah, it just keeps getting worse. And that one requires full construct reconstruction because the base material is all clay and soft underneath it. We talked about that before. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. McCullough? So I'll move <laughs> on to uh, the shoreline erosion. We've done presentations to the council uh, in the past on a, a couple occasions. Uh, we've met with the Corps of Engineers. We actually had their uh, a lot of their design staff from, from the district, from Ohio and uh, Detroit that came up and met with us. Uh, there are some possibilities uh, that we can request assistance, but if we are successful, that assistance is likely at least three years out. Um, we also met with uh, State Representative O'Malley uh, last week yeah, and uh, looked for any assistance that the state could give us. So we've been trying to explore uh, any options that are out there to assist us with this. Um, the state's working on it, but there's nothing available today. Um, the feds possibly have assistance. And the only thing that they could uh, point us towards is if we could, we could make a request to say that their design, the design of their structures have damaged our infrastructure. Um, and what they would do is likely, they would ask Congress for money to approve a study, and the study wouldn't look on how to improve the city's stuff that's impacted. It would look at how to change their structure so it doesn't happen again, but it doesn't fix anything for us. Um, and I think I've also mentioned to you that <coughs> Um, the first year we started having these high water issues, we were really successful dealing with our insurance company and they were covering our losses. Um, the, the recent losses to the damage to the river walk and the retaining wall for the parking structure or parking area at First Street, um, it's been a flat out denial. I tried to appeal it, they've flat out denied it. Um, it's pretty clear they're, they're trying to avoid paying out those claims now. So um, it's been, been quite challenging. Um, <clears throat> in addition, we know that all the forecasts are that the lake could rise another 12 inches this year. So it's really not the, the level of the water, but when we get storm surges or winds, um, they're having devastating effects to our shoreline properties. Here's a couple pictures uh, of the damaged river walk section. 
and it's probably hard to see in the to the right but if you drive by and look at that that fence that fence should be in a straight line um, you'll see there's an area where there's a big dip where that wall is failing and, and overturning right now and then some of the damage as it comes upstream that's um, you probably can't even see from uh, from first street So we had the engineers uh, evaluate. We actually have erosion that goes almost from the stub pier all the way up to about Tamarack Street. And we broke those into what's called three reaches, reach A, B, and C. Reach A uh, is a armored bank, um, but it's armored with old concrete and sidewalks and stuff that was just dumped by the city uh, decades ago. Um, we've got two sections of that that are actively eroding, one that's close to our pump station, actually. Reach B is from the uh, boat launch uh, upstream about to where the private houses start along First Street, and that's where the river walk is absolutely destroyed. Um, so we've got some cost estimates on what it would take to, uh, to protect those areas. And then Reach C is river walk where we've got severe bank erosion, and the city actually owns the river frontage there, um, and then there's private houses up at the top of the bluff that are being impacted. So one of the things that we've talked about internally is um, the insurance company paid us to repair or reimburse us to repair a section of the river walk that was damaged two years ago. Um, and if I go back to this picture, the one on the, that's on the lower right, you can see there's new wood there there's a section of the repaired river walk that was absolutely washed away and, and damaged again. So clearly with the water levels this high and with the uh, potential for additional wave actions, it doesn't make any sense to build that structure back there in the same fashion and have it happen again and possibly happen again and again. So what we're recommending is armoring the shoreline with heavy stone. Uh, that stone will, number one, protects the wave impacts, but it also dissipates the energy and actually calms the water within the harbor, and then the river walk along this section would be elevated so that it's up out of that danger zone. And you can see the total improvements there are about $1.5 million. Also something that we've been dealing with is uh, flooding at Fifth Avenue. Um, anytime we get a wind from the west or the northwest, the wave actions and the, and the water actually piles up on the west or along our shoreline and it's running up the beach and it tips into the, the cul-de-sac at Fifth Avenue and ends up flooding out all the streets in that area. Um, we've had the water as deep as two and a half feet um, and off, whenever that happens we have to barricade it off and, and do not allow vehicles into there so people can't reach their homes. Um, it reduces uh, access to the Coast Guard station and has a uh, significant impact on uh, rescue, um, the availability for rescue to get in. And the water gets so high that it actually runs down 4th Avenue and dumps back into the channel at uh, Harbor Village. So uh, we've been talking about some mitigation efforts on what we could do to <coughs> slow the water from getting in. Is there a way that we can assist in getting it back out? Um, right now the, the storm sewer system that's in that area is flooded and so it takes a long time for that water to, to drain itself back out. So <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Where did Ed go? Oh. Let's talk about the I, I have a quick question about the Fifth Avenue. Sure. Um, several, a couple years ago you talked about putting up a uh, wall. Um, at the uh, west side of the parking lot mm -hmm. and then a second wall. That never happened. Um, would that have helped at all with any of this flooding? That's what we've been talking about is there, there may be a way to berm it temporarily or build some sort of wall that would deflect some of that wave action. Mm -hmm. We still have water that when the ripples of waves come down the channel, if it tops the top of the seawall, it's actually following the barrier-free sidewalk back to the parking lot so a lot of water comes in there. Excuse me, we've been talking internally uh -huh. some techniques on how we could possibly mitigate that. Are we ever going to get to the point where we're going to put those walls up? Uh, it's quite possible. 
and, and it may be necessary. So that's okay. part of what this whole discussion is. Okay. Fifth Avenue Beach House. Uh, we've had water come right up to the sidewalk around that beach house. Well, we're losing, we're rapidly losing our beach. Pretty soon you'll be sunbathing in the parking lot if it continues to go up. Yeah, um, I'm sure everybody's been down there or seen the pictures of our 911 yeah. tower that's leaning. And that's <clears throat> that's got to be two, three cubic feet of concrete down below that that's deep. And um, it's already severed the wires and stuff. So internally we're trying to figure out a plan on how to get it straightened up and, and anchored into the into the ground until the water subsides. Been any consideration on how we might protect that beach house? Um, this would be the same conversation here. The beach house is, is actually one of the only areas there that's up out of the the new uh, FEMA floodplain. Where did you go? Correct? Right. That one was up out of the floodplain, but, but when you've got the wave run up, um, it, it still climbs that beach and it, it gets real close to that building. Well, it's getting pretty, it's getting to where you could almost have an underground parking lot underneath that slabs. There's a lot of space. Uh, yeah. It's washing out quite, quite a bit under there. Oh. Okay. I, I guess I have another question, Jeff, you got just a sure. second. At one time, I remember years ago, there used to be a pumping station down there. Mm -hmm. Did that, help that high water or, or that flooding the there was a pump station that was on fifth avenue and um when the channel was put in to serve harbor village that pump station was removed but a new one was built um it's just hidden with landscaping okay. and we've been working with the homeowners down there because a lot of them have some pumps that were pumping water directly into the sanitary sewer that increases the flows to the plant especially during wet weather. So um, a lot of them have, and I give those, those homeowners credit, most of them have um, disconnected that and they're trying to pump to someplace else. Right now they're trying to pump it into our storm sewer, which is underwater. But uh, there is a lot of efforts being put in by the homeowners there. There's only one, there's only one down there, isn't there? One storm sewer right there uh, by the Coast Guard station? No, so there's there's a pipeline that runs and discharges at the end of Fifth Avenue, but it 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 goes back to Fourth Avenue. I've heard that a lot of that is dry wells. Is that? There's quite a bit of dry wells down there as well. And that is there anything you can do to dry wells to make them more efficient? Uh, not unless they were, unless, not unless we removed them and put in new coarse stone and rewrapped them in in fabric. Um, I mean, they, they operate the, the way that they're supposed to, but at the time they were built, there was a compromise between spending 100000 to build pipelines or, or whether to build dry wells, and that was the decision. So it does take time for that to soak into the, the ground. A few of the, a little while ago when we had the real high wind, it was interesting to see the water going by the Coast Guard station and running right on down the street yeah. and dumping onto the other side. That was quite... Especially when we have weather like this where then it freezes and yeah. there were several layers of ice that built up in there. It was a mess. Well, I hope there's something we can do for those people down there. They're, it's it's pretty bad. Yep. So um, Jeff's discussion about the high water is kind of a nice segue into um, talking about the broader array of capital <coughs> that um, are coming up and how the city might finance those and how the city might actually uh, fund those. So just a, a brief overview. Um, we have a variety of capital uh, planning documents that we use. Um, we have our transportation improvement plan, which Jeff referenced, which changes on a monthly basis. Um, that's based on the asset management principles that we've laid out in our um, asset management plan for streets. Uh, we have a general capital improvement plan that's approved as part of the budget process um, for areas like marina, the boat launch, parks, kind of general fund items. Um, utility capital improvement plans, those are approved as part of the budget, and then there's also more detailed planning documents that uh, Spicer and Jeff work on um, to, and that are required by Eagle as well. Um, our building asset management plan is nearing completion, and then we have a motor pool plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Each of those plans looks out um, a number of years into the future and tries to anticipate what needs are, and obviously the farther you get out, the the uh, harder it is to make those accurate, but we, we try to do a reasonable time frame so we aren't caught unaware with future things. 
Um, but these plans aren't necessarily a funding plan because we always have more projects than we have available dollars to pay for them. So sometimes they just kind of serve as a reminder or a placeholder. Um, and we, pro we fund those projects as resources become available. Um, some of these projects have multiple components. For instance, a lot of the street <coughs> projects that we do have underground utilities that need to be taken care of, whether that's water, sewer, or both. And so you have to make sure that those capital improvement plans mesh with each other, line up, and, and that the timing works for them. And uh, we also have another, a number of projects that are scheduled that we have to do. We don't have the cash to pay for them, so we're going to have to finance them in some fashion. Um, an example of some of these projects, uh, our wet weather corrective action plan that Sean's been talking about and we've been talking about for a number of years, um, those are going to be fully financed by USDA rural development through a combination of low interest loans and uh, grant potentially. And I'm pleased to say today we closed on uh, our first uh, loan with rural development, um, over $4 million. And we took our first draw, which will help pay us back for some of the expenses we've incurred. So we're kind of off and running on that. Uh, the phase two is still at the national office being reviewed. We're hopeful that we can close on that uh, maybe by June um, if everything goes well. So that's moving ahead, but it was, we had a full room here for the pre-construction meeting and then all the attorneys and people signing paperwork. Uh, it was quite the spectacle and with the mayor, I uh, got to experience that today. So it was nice that we were able to get that closed for the phase one. Um, some of our smaller capital improvement <coughs> projects, we just pay out of our current resources. It's kind of a pay-go basis. So for example, uh, the DPW is going to have some electrical upgrades done at the garage. Um, we pay for our file servers, smaller water and sewer improvements, and a number of other projects on an annual basis we just pay for. However, there's other projects that need to be done that we don't have the current financial resources to pay for that we have to finance. And um, each of those projects has different possible financing mechanisms, and they also can be paid for by a variety of different sources of funds. So example of some of our financing mechanisms could be rural development through the USDA, um, DWSRF and CWSRF, which are drinking water and clean water state revolving funds, low interest loans that you can get through the state. Um, we can do revenue bonds. We can do capital improvement bonds. We can do installment purchase contracts. Um, you can get state grants as well. And then the sources of funds to repay those loans through the finance, and could be from our utility revenues, whether that be water or sewer, um, general revenues from taxpayers and state funding, um, our capital improvement fund revenues, revenues that come in from Act 51 for our streets, um, other grants, other donations. So we spent a lot of time over the last couple of months kind of reviewing our full scope of plan projects and how they might be financed. Um, there's several street projects that are coming up that require water and sewer work. Um, there isn't the resources from a current financial standpoint in the water and sewer fund to pay for those. So those are going to have to be financed. We've always known that. Um, we did look at uh, possibly tapping the drinking water state revolving fund for some of the water main options. But since the last time we viewed that funding source, there's a few things that have changed. Um, one is uh, they are now require Davis-Bacon wages on those projects, which drives up the cost <coughs> up to 15%. Two, they, they don't really give you the option to spread one loan out over multiple years, so you end up having to do it in several different financings. And because of the nature of our projects, we don't, um, it's not very cost effective to do that because you end up incurring multiple bond council fees. Um, and closing costs. And then also, um, you have to do a project plan for DWSRF, which is a $25,000 item. So it really didn't provide us uh, the needed flexibility. Also, um, our projects wouldn't qualify for principal forgiveness, which was a key attraction for going that route, just because they weren't green, they weren't for service line replacements, they didn't check the boxes and criteria for some level of a grant. Um, we could also consider revenue bonds for those water projects, but the sizing of what we needed to do probably wouldn't be the most cost effective. So when we were thinking through how to finance these needed water improvements, uh, the topic of the shoreline erosion came up. And obviously there's about a million and a half dollars of work that potentially needs to be done there. So we've had a lot of more internal discussions about financing. We finally settled on the approach that we would recommend, which would be to do a capital improvement bond um, for a number of reasons. We can finance multiple projects with that. It's very flexible. Um, you have up to three years to spend the bond proceeds, which works with the timing of some of our street projects. 
And because it's one bond issue, it's also very cost effective. Um, we've done a couple of capital improvement bonds in the past. This is a relatively recent addition to the Municipal Financing Act. So in the past, we didn't have that um, ability to issue those. But we did a capital improvement bond for City Hall. And then we did a capital improvement bond in 2010 that funded a variety of projects similar to what we'd be proposing here. There were some street projects, some utility projects that were funded with that. The other thing that we can do by doing a capital improvement bond is uh, we have an opportunity to refinance the existing 2010 capital improvement bond. The rates on that are right around four and a quarter. And uh, by refinancing that, those rates will come down quite a bit. I, we have not run the numbers with the financial advisor, but there's definitely savings <coughs> be available for that. So if we were to issue a capital improvement bond, part of that would also be to refinance an existing bond to save some money. Um, this would also give us the opportunity to address capital projects that we don't currently have a financing source for and an opportunity to address several high priority projects. This table here shows on the right the different projects that um, staff feels are appropriate for this type of a bond or high priority things that have been planned or things that have come up. So I'll just run through those briefly and Jeff and Sean can check if they want. So we talked about the shoreline erosion and river walk for about a million and a half uh, and some flood mitigation on Fifth Avenue. Um, we talked uh, for a while about the North River Walk uh, Memorial Park area where that has exceeded its useful life. It, there's some safety concerns um, and there's been discussion about trying to renovate that um, and take advantage of a Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund grant, potentially. Um, we have several building items that have come out, um, partially from our building asset management plan. Um, we had a thorough roof evaluation done of all of our buildings. Some, some projects came out of that. There's some work that needs to be done here on City Hall where we're having some leaking and some, some issues in the, the membrane area that's between the metal roof and the balustrade. Uh, the fire station needs to be re-roofed. The waterworks building needs to be re-roofed. And we have a placeholder in for the fire station because they have a few structural issues and also some issues with the exterior of the building um, with some tuck pointing and some brick that's spalling and stuff. Uh, Sean's, uh, Sean's from Spicer Group, their architect is taking a closer look at that and gonna refine those numbers. So that's more of a placeholder for that right now. And then we get into the water projects. We have a water main loop that goes underneath the Jackson and Van Buren Street project. We have a water main loop that goes under the Quincy and Cleveland Street project. We have a water main that needs to be replaced under the Washington Street project if that gets funded by MDOT. Uh, when MDOT replaces the M55 <coughs> bridge, we have to relocate both a sewer line and a water line. Um, MDOT's gonna be doing that work, but we have to pay for that. Uh, the Maywood tank is due to have an interior painting and the uh, industrial park tank is due to have an exterior recoding that has to be done periodically. And then the, as part of the roof evaluation, I spoke about several of the well houses uh, were evaluated and they're at a phase where we can put new roofs on them, um, potentially uh, or renovate the roofs that are there cheaper than replacing them. So the timing on that is right. Uh, we have some sewer that needs to go underneath Quincy and Cleveland. And then down at the marina, um, we were not able to get all of the docks replaced from the SASH damage. The insurance company only paid for the ones that were to the west and the remaining docks to the east even though we put uh, a raised platform on them, are likely to be unusable this summer. So the discussion there has been, let's try to get a waterways grant and finish replacing those docks and also possibly the dock that the gas pump is on. So when you add all of those projects up, they come up to about $5 million, um, but you've got some grant funding, so you're looking at about 9% leverage. So you'd be looking at a total new money bond issue of about 4.6 million. And if you throw the 3.9 million for the refunding on top of that, you'd be looking at you know a little over eight. The refunding, all it does is saves us money though it doesn't count towards our bond limit. It's just replacing higher cost debt with lower cost debt. And then if you look at the left side of that chart, there's a kind of an estimated sources and uses of where those funds would come from over time. So about 46% would be from the general fund, about 36% from the water funds, 8% from sewer, and about 9% from capital improvement. The reason there's nothing for streets is the street projects that are on here, we're able to pay for through the street fund resources as um, 
supplemented by the general fund and capital improvement fund per our plan. So we don't need to bond for the street part of those projects. It's for the utilities that are underground. Uh, Jeff's going to talk a little bit about two projects that were on this list, the North Riverwalk Memorial Park upgrades and the uh, remaining dock improvements. <coughs> so at Memorial Park, um, if any of you have walked through there, it's, it's all the landscaping has grown up beyond, um, beyond its life. Uh, it was mostly built out of timbers, all that timbers rotted. The, uh, the concrete, the top picture is actually the concrete wall that was there. We've got uh, people in the community that are picking those things up, throwing them into the river. And uh, the access down to the stairs and stuff are very dangerous. There's a lot of trip hazards. And uh, when we had the landscape architect uh, look at it, um, their, their recommendation was if you can't fix it, you're going to need to close it. So this is something that we've had conversations with at the Parks Commission. Um, we've talked with the Veterans uh, Council about teaming up with them. Uh, the JCs have made this their signature project to raise money to, to help offset the cost for it. And we're in the position to apply for a MDNR trust, grant, trust fund grant, um, but we have to commit to the DNR when we apply that the city is willing to, willing and uh, capable of meeting the, the match requirements. So uh, the next application deadline is April 1st. Same thing with the marina docks. Um, last year we submitted a grant application to the uh, waterways grant and aid. Um, they had a new, if you recall, they had a new requirement that you had to have a harbor master plan. So in anticipation of this grant application, we've completed that grant or that, um, that harbor master plan that's been submitted to the state. Um, the total cost is about 390 to replace those remaining docks. Um, our intention would be to, on both of these projects, would be to make the grant applications, uh, this one to the waterways, but we would also uh, make smaller requests from the, um, possibly the community foundation and try to leverage as much as possible. Um, but again, this grant is, is due April 1st and requires uh, a stated commitment to match the match the grant amount. So did you want to summarize that or? Thanks. So um, as we're working through this, we, we knew that those utility projects, we've known for years that those were going to require some financing. Um, the, it seemed to make sense when we had the waterfront improvements that were required that if we were going to uh, do a bond, instead of doing several bond issues, combine those all into the, into the one capital improvement bond. Um, like Ed said, it does create some opportunities to fund other capital improvements that have kind of been waiting in queue and some that are critical. Um, the two things that, um, that we really need to know from council up front is, um, is there interest in, in using money from a bond proceeds to match the grant application for the North River Walk and for the waterways grant and aid? And then really, is there other projects that you see that were on that list that maybe shouldn't be on there? Or are there projects that are in our capital improvement plans that, that even could be added to that list and taken advantage of this issue? Are you looking for an answer tonight? I mean, right now? <laughs> Well, I don't think we're looking for an answer on the overall bond tonight because that'll play out over the course. But for the two grant projects that Jeff just identified, if we're interested in pursuing those, we have to commit to that match and we have to get those applications in by April 1st. So, Well, for the city that, match, where's the money going to come from? So for, for both of those, our portion would be part of the bond and then it would be paid back for those particular projects through the capital improvement fund. Or, and possibly the general fund. Those details we're still kind of sorting out, but more than likely the capital improvement fund. Um, the issue is if council consensus is to move forward with those two projects, we would come back in, uh, in March with those grant applications, probably at the second meeting in March, um, because of that April 1 deadline. 
So that's what we need kind of a, a consensus on early on. The rest of these projects, we're going to keep refining the, the costs and putting together the numbers and getting the estimates from the financial advisor. Uh, we can't issue that bond until after July 1st because that's the earliest we could do it to refinance the 2010 bond. So there's plenty of time on that. We would still have to issue a notice of intent um, and those sorts of things. And, and with, with the Riverside, North uh, Riverside Park, that's the worst case scenario for a match from the city. Uh, there is a uh, developer that once their project gets going is uh, going to donate 30000 to that project. <coughs> we have a service club that is going to uh, assist. They have cash to contribute, plus they'll help us fundraise through crowdfunding. And as Jeff mentioned, we're also going to approach the Community Foundation for additional grant dollars. So that represents the worst case scenario for the city. However, we, we have to make application, as you've heard before, April 1st, so we're going to need a commitment to, to find out if council wants to do that uh, or not. I have a work session then. To me, it, it, it makes sense to, to, you know, spend, you know, uh, our money with uh, somebody else kicking in over half against it. Um, I, I, just, I have a question. I'm trying to figure out a way to, to word it properly. Would we have we have things being paid off that can help with this, the cost of this bond? Sure. So um, this is another reason why a capital improvement bond is much more desirable than going with one of the state funding sources. We have the ability to structure the payment streams on that 20-year bond to wrap around our existing city hall debt. And by doing that, we'll still be able to pay on the city hall debt, we'll be able to pay a little bit, and there's, there's four years left on the city hall debt. So we'll be able to wrap it around those to make the cash flow manageable and then ramp up the payments after city hall bond debt is paid off. I think the final year of payments for the city hall is around $280,000. So we'll be able to use a portion of that to help pay for some of these particular projects. That's the, one of the reasons that this works. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to afford to do that um, out, of the, out of the revenues there. So we can do these things without impacting current services or having to charge our taxpayers anymore? Any, any? We won't have to charge our taxpayers anymore. Um, every year we evaluate the water and sewer fund. As it stands right now, absent something changing, it looks like we'll be able to service this additional debt as well. Um, that's a, a, we, we still have to close on the rural development phase two loan. Obviously, that's a big yeah. caveat, but that's pretty much assured. Um, the, the issue becomes on those two items for the marina and for the uh, Veterans Memorial Park, it, it's just a timing issue. It's a t you know, we have to commit as a city that we would do that match. The only way to fund that match is to do the bond, so that's why we, we put them on here. If council decides that they don't want to pursue those two projects, then we pull them off there and, and that bond amount becomes less. But we lose the leverage of about 9%, because those are the only two projects on this list that there's really um, any kind of state grant or other grant funding as, as the city manager mentioned there's some developers that are going to be kicking in some money and some service club and you know there may be some other little donations like that but for significant grant dollars those are the only two projects where that's really available kind of uh, financial you. question um do you think you can you said the interest rate was four and a quarter roughly on the last few years of the city hall. can we get that under four percent do you think if we if we move um, fast enough i had the the financial advisor run a pro forma for a two and a half million dollar bond and the, the true interest cost, which takes into uh, consideration all the different years, was about 2.5%. So there will be significant savings. I think we should do that. I mean, if we, if we do nothing, none of this, which we, we don't, that's not an option, but at a minimum, we would be refinancing. <coughs> I, I think you have to. Yeah. And, and honestly, the, you, by the end of this season, those docks are almost at water level. So. Uh, clearly, if we want to have a marina, we're going to have to do something. And uh, you can't just keep building a, a platform on top of a platform. I, I guess maybe you could one more time, but it still doesn't seem to make any sense. So I think it's something that, that is required. And I'm assuming we would have a similar company build something very similar to what we've done with the docks that were replaced where they were able to be raised or lowered as water's level rise or fall. Yeah, we the intent if 
if we receive the financing and the grants for, for the dock replacements, we would replace them with exactly what we've got on the rest of the marina. And hopefully we could time that with shoreline improvements so we've got one contractor working from a barge mm -hmm. and can do both of those projects. <coughs> if, if you don't do the things that are here, um, do we continue to let the city haul roof leak into the point that it causes more damage? Um, do we not fix the waterwork building and let it deteriorate and tear it down? Um, the fire station, of <coughs> the, we have a historical landmark. Do we just let it deteriorate to the point that we end up tearing it down? Um, to me, there's not a lot of options here. Um, either let it go to go and tear it down and, and be done with it, or you fix it and maintain it. Um, that's my position on it. I think we, we need to at least take a, a better look at it, or a longer look. And, and the shoreline erosion, obviously, you know, it, it's something that we can't, uh, for the, the sake of the citizens that live on the water as well as for us. I mean, you know, we, we have to do something and uh, you can't just kick that can down the road indefinitely. You know, you could, you could live with a pothole, but, you know, when something's washed away, you know, it doesn't come back. So if, if we don't do that section of the um, shoreline protection, Certainly, we're going to lose that parking lot, that overlooked parking lot. Oh, that's, and we may lose those five homes as well. Right, and we also have water main or a sewer main running along there that's that's impacted, and we've lost you know one of our biggest one of our biggest attractions and uses, which is the river walk. So I I, I don't think we can ignore it. And staff has done a good job of picking up uh, projects that are needs rather than wants. And if you, Jeff touched on it, all the water projects are in support of road projects. Uh, and we were, gonna, we were gonna finance those anyhow under the state program, but this is more advantageous to, to us. So, uh, and I'm very confident that these aren't wants, these are absolute needs. And, and we talked about this before, about capital, you know, about looking at doing some real capital improvements. So this is a good way to, to, to begin that process. And, and like I said, with, with somebody giving us more than half of what we want towards the, the uh, North River Walk Memorial <laughs> Park and the, uh, the, the marina, it would be ridiculous to not pursue somebody else giving us more than half of the cost to associated with fixing it. Jeff, I have a question. Um, living here or being around here for quite a few years and, and watching the water go up and down, is this repair for the shoreline river, for the shoreline erosion around that river walk area? Maybe Sean better answer. Is this, is this the best we can do? Is this middle ground? Is this, what, what between one and three, what, what, is this the best we can do? Well, I believe that, I believe it's the best. Um, there are certainly different options, but I believe it's, it's the best because it's long term. Um, the armoring doesn't have, you know, degradation. Um, certainly, you could put in a, a steel sheet pile wall, but that just reflects the energy back, and it and it pushes the problem someplace else, even though it protects you. <clears throat> and I believe that it's the best long term solution for the community. Well, you know where I'm going with that is that in five years you don't want to have to come back and say, hey, you know what? we need to do something again it yeah and fix it right the first time I guess. yeah and this is one of those cases where it wasn't heavy armored when it was built but the water wasn't high and there weren't those issues and so for 20 some years it's been okay but now we're dealing with those high water issues and it's not okay and i, I guarantee the water is going to go down and i will guarantee it's going to come back up some at some point that the lake cycles. So yeah, this I believe that this would be the best best investment. The other thing when when Thad was talking about those erosion issues, there's also the unknown. When you get this high water and you get those big storms, you you destabilized what's there. So some of that damage isn't even known or obvious. This would overlay that armor it and protect it so that we don't have more issues that happen in a year or in two years or in five years. Council have any any negative thoughts about proceeding with this? 
just, a, just a lot of money. It is it's a lot, lot of money. money. Well, I just like the, I, I, you know, if we're going to operate in debt, we might as well get the best rates on it. So I think it's a, a prudent direction to refinance. So. Do you have enough information, Mr. Taylor? Yes. Thank you. Jeff, you all done? <laughs> Plus, you have anything for me? You're done. Okay. F. Consideration of endorsing the, the housing north home for a future campaign and the principle it supports and advocates for the, the region. The Homes of Our Future campaign is an initiative of the Housing North to help the region understand and take part in a housing solution. The campaign is called the Action for the Public Local. I'm going to try that again. The campaign is a call to action for, from the public, local governments, employees, and community organization. It is intended to provide a clear course of action and resources to engage in support and lead work toward housing solutions. At this time, Council could take action to adopt a resolution of endorsement from Homes of Our Future to help strengthen the message in the region of the relevancy of housing for community growth. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. A motion is second. Is there any discussion or questions? What exactly, how does that help? Great, I have a presentation for you guys. <laughs> Roger, is, it's, it's a point. Well, it's very nice to be here in front of you all tonight. Thank you for having me again. Um, this is gonna be a very short presentation about what the campaign is supposed to be doing in communities. Um, so as, as you know, now I'm working with Housing North, which is the same organization that uh, set, served with Rising Tide and doing the housing action plan for the city. Um, a lot of the whole focus of the Homes for Our Future campaign is, to put it simple, is providing resources for advocacy in local communities. Really is, uh, because of the way the Housing North is funded, we provide resources, we could get you uh, campaign uh, goodies, we could do presentations for you, we can really go with you if your community has a housing development project that you need support for. Um, to again, support housing in the community. Um, the whole point of the campaign, one, is a call to action for local governments. So we've had, in the case of Manistee, we're already a redevelopment ready certified community, so our master plan has already been looked at. Uh, the city worked last year with the whole rising tide zoning recommendations, but in most communities there are still um, zoning changes that can be made to ease the housing development project, so that is one of the objectives too having local government look at their zoning and really find solutions or tweaks that can be done to support housing. Um, the second one is raising awareness. How does housing constrain and impacts the growth and economic development of a community? Um, the third one is kind of what I just mentioned about the Housing Ready Community, the program that Housing North will provide like a checklist that you could have as a local unit of government to um, look over your master plan. Uh, the city's already participating with the housing action plan that we presented last year, so the city's pretty much ahead of all of this at this point. Uh, and the fourth one is provide support. And when I talk about providing support is that Housing North is focused in doing advocacy for the whole Northwest region. Uh, and it legitimizes a lot the message of the importance of housing if we have local governments on board uh, with the legislative uh, initiatives that we have. Um, the Networks Northwest and Housing North worked in a target market analysis, just the same number that Mark mentioned earlier for Manistee. There is, sorry, this is not the number. It's 400 uh, <coughs> units that are needed for the city of Manistee, and then the overall region need is 15,540 units. Uh, the data comes from the American Community Surveys in the census. Um, for the most part, a lot of what I'm looking today from you is having the city, through the endorsement of the resolution, express the support for our principles of advocacy, uh, support housing development, which you're cl clearly so engaged with, uh, as we saw in the previous uh, presentation we had before about that senior housing, and then legitimizing our regional efforts for 
advocacy once again. Um, there are different ways to endorse the campaign. We have ways for community members to do it, to just go on our website and sign up. They can ask for presentations. They can ask for me to come to the organization and do uh, a presentation on the target market analysis or the initiatives that we have. Uh, local governments do it by signing the resolution of support. And then business and community organizations like employers can start uh, to have active measures to support housing, which we're also working with right now. Um, I wanted to present to you some of the things that Housing North is working right now for uh, legislative advocacy. So the first one is kind of looking at the rule book uh, or the way that low income housing tax credits are given in our region. Your city manager was present uh, a week ago in a discussion we had in Traverse City with other local units of government kind of discussing this. Um, last week we had a, an employer assisted housing a tax credit discussion in which the Chamber of Commerce actively participated too and kind of finding different solutions through employers to have uh, like a fund locally to support repairs or housing development in the region. Um, the other thing that I know Housing North is working for is having a regional housing authority and then having a residential facilities exemption. All of these are in discussion right now, but part of signing, if you sign the resolution or adopt it, would be kind of expressing your support for the advocacy for housing in general in our region. Um, and then this is just really how to get involved for the citizens and anybody that wants more information or needs resources. Um, do you think that answers the question? Yep. Yes. <laughs> is there any other question? Would you like to read the resolution for the uh, it's pretty long. I don't have it in front of me. I don't have it in the presentation. I happen to have it right here. Oh, okay. I can read it if you want me to. Okay, so whereas the target market analysis points to a potential demand in the city of Manistee for 396 units in 2020, Whereas national studies have shown development and housing supply to be constrained by a rising construction cost, changes in the market, and a labor shortage. And whereas the imbalance between supply and demand is impacting our community's ability to provide housing for young families, seniors, and the workforce, which is affecting the sustainability and growth opportunities of local businesses and school. And whereas the lack of adequate housing has been shown to have serious impacts on the health, access to opportunity and achievement levels of individuals, particularly vul vulnerable populations like children and seniors. Whereas Housing North is advancing a campaign to raise awareness and support for housing solutions, such as the consideration and adoption of common sense local policies and practice that will increase the supply of housing in our community and advances, adv advancement at the state level of policies that expand and improve access to housing resources for all communities. And whereas the city of Manistee supports Housing North's work towards housing solution for the housing shortage in our community in collaboration with multiple cross-sector partners. And whereas these efforts will create uh, new private investment, jobs, and revenue in the form of construction, rehabilitation, management and maintenance, and tax revenue. And whereas community organizations and businesses are important advocates and champions for encouraging local action and local, statewide, and federal housing initiatives and proposals. proposals. Now therefore be it that the city of Manistee endorses the Homes for a Future campaign and expresses support for Housing North's efforts to create new housing options that ensure our communities remain places where we can all live, work, raise families, and thrive. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, you are. Are there any other questions for me? No? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. So, do we have a motion? I have, I've lost. Yes, we have a motion and a second. Well, we'll take the roll. Yep. Okay. We have no further discussion. Take the roll. <coughs> Councilmember Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Sipsick. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Cooper. Yes. Mayor Zielinski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Concerns and comments. Citizens comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on municipal services, activities, or area of city involvement. 
Citizens in attendance shall be recognized by the mayor for comments, limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will not be publicly read. Do we have anybody that would like to make comments to council tonight? <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, great night today as far as 46 uh, proposed houses for the seniors, that's a, that's a great thing. I also wanna thank the city for including the county in the rising tide effort. Uh, one of the things that's come out of that obviously is the coordination and networking that we've been done. It's been great opportunities. Uh, the county today, <coughs> our board meeting, we are going to adopt the logo. We're gonna look at some different color schemes possibly, but uh, the shared logo between the city and the county lives on. It's, 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 we aren't gonna do it overnight, obviously, for financial reasons, but uh, we are gonna move that way. So again, we'll have some colors put together and see what happens. The biggest reason I'm here tonight is we have a new emergency manager, uh, Jason Torrey, who was a sergeant with the Sheriff's Department for what, 19, 21 years? 20. And uh, he has moved up to lieutenant now and is our new emergency manager. Uh, Brian Gutowski, is, as you know, went to under sheriff. So with that, Jason. Welcome, Jason. Welcome. Thanks for having us. And I would just like to say we've already uh, started our relationship. We met with uh, manager Taylor earlier today to talk about some possible alleviation of things with the water efforts. Good. They forgot to tell you you were a dog handler. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's in the past. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, hello again, uh, everyone. Uh, well, last week I thought we were going to have a discussion on this whole resolution for equal justice, inclusion, and diversity thing. Excuse me, sir. Could yeah. you state your name and address first? Oh, yeah. Chris Schultz, 500 Second Street. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, it didn't say anywhere on the city council's website or in the agenda of those people who are going to come here. And on the... Um, website of the uh, news advocate it only said we were going to have a discussion not a resolution then they came with one and only two people were heard from against it i don't think there was adequate public hearing of uh the resolution the proposed resolution and uh have you guys uh decided to do anything with that uh, uh did you change it or is it worded as it was then the resolution hasn't been written yet uh, it hasn't? Yeah. Uh, no. When uh, will you have some information about that? It'll be at our meeting. You will be able to see the resolution on the website. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but, yeah, I was so uh, we'll be able to uh, comment on it then? Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'll keep a lookout then on the website for that and uh, come back uh, whenever we have it for public comment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Any, yeah. Anyone else? Seeing none, Mr. Taylor. I think there's been enough discussion tonight. I'll pass. City Attorney. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. City Clerk. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. City Engineer. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, I wish I had something for you. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bradford. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Public safety? Jeff wanted me to talk about it for a little more, but I don't have anything else. Okay. DPW. Nothing, Your Honor. Nothing further. Wow. I, I'm pretty sure that was saying we're done. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. <laughs> Aaron. Mr. Kowalski. I just want to thank Chief Kozo and his officers for coming over on 12th Street and cleaning up that dumpster mess. Thank you. Mr. Smansky? Nothing. Nothing. Mr. Cooper? Nothing. I do have a bit to say. I, I was not here at the last meeting because I've been sick. Um, however, I did watch the video, and my comments right now are going to be directed toward the RAD program uh, that was presented by the housing director for Century Terrace and um, uh, Harbor View. I don't know how the rest of council feels, but if I had been here last week, I would have made this comment. 
that I am not comfortable signing off on a $10 million project without even being inside the buildings. I think it is, it's just something I would not be able to say yes to unless I could actually see and be inside the buildings and see what needs to be done so I could best understand myself why it's going to cost between fifty-six and sixty thousand dollars per unit. I'm also a little bit dismayed by the fact that uh, the housing director had come to us um, a couple years ago and had painstakingly gave us a presentation on how he was rehabbing one unit at a time and that process seems to have died. Now I, I recognize there probably is a need to rehab those buildings but I don't think I can comfortably sign off on a $10 million project without actually being invited inside and seeing the inside of both of those buildings. And I hope that council thinks about that because that's a big commitment for us to make. Anything else? Sipka? I have nothing. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion. Adjourn. Adjourn.